G'day, I'm Harry Brown. I've been a member of the Woodcraft Guild for seven years now. Uh, I joined in 2014. I'm an experienced woodworker. I've been butchering wood, as Dad would say, from the time I was able to recognise a crosscut saw from a tenon saw. I'm an assessor for accreditation on the machines and machinery room, and today I'm here to introduce you to the 14 inch Laguna bandsaw. Okay, the 14 inch Laguna is measured by the width of the blade, or between the blade and the frame of the, the saw, or by the size of the wheels, the drive and, and idler wheel. Now we're going to open up the saw, so I have to make it safe. And to do that, I remove the plug from the power point and put it where I know it cannot be uh, reinserted. Turn off the emergency stop. That, together with the on control and off control, will stop the, stop the saw. However, the blade will keep running because of inertia in the wheels. To stop the blade, the quickest way to stop it is to use the foot brake. Inside the lower cabinet, and I'll point out where it is, there is a switch that also turns off the power and the brake the blade will stop tension the blade. is checked by using a finger. Without using undue, pre undue pressure, it should move no more than four to five mil as it's doing now. As a visual check, there is a window in the door and an indicator to show the approximate tension or blade size and the tension on it. The tension on the blade is adjusted by turning this wheel. I'm not going to do it because the blade is properly tensioned at the moment. Also around the back of the machine, there is a quick release detensioning lever, which is this one. The tension has now been released off the blade and that is normally done to assist in changing the blade, not for any, practical, any operational purposes. So we'll leave it with the tension on. To adjust the tracking, it's this knob. First up, you loosen off the locking knob and then adjust this knob, left or right, and that will change where the blade tracks on the wheel. Remembering you've got to keep the gullets of the teeth close to the, to, to the centre of the wheel, the crown of it. Once you've completed, lock it off again. To check the tracking, use the window in the side of the, the, the cabinet and the gullets of the teeth close to where my finger's pointing at the moment, should be riding on the crown of the wheel. The wheel has a rubber band on it that is crowned and therefore the gullet should be close to the centre of the wheel. A bandsaw is so called because the blade is a continuous steel circle. It's a continuous band. It goes around the bottom wheel, up through the frame, around the top wheel, and down, and it's this part that actually does the cutting. The blade is guided by your guides and thrust bearing. The guides should sit approximately no, or no more than one millimeter from the side of the blade. The thrust bearing is this big white disc at the back, and there should be just a small amount of play between it and the back of the blade, the smooth side of the blade. Okay. Okay. Yes. Guide bearings can be adjusted by loosening these two screws and moving them in or out. The thrust bearing by loosening this one and moving the whole assembly backwards and forwards. Now on these, these Lagunas, the bearings are, are ceramic and therefore in use you can sometimes see sparking, and this is absolutely normal. If ever you think that the bearings need adjustment, the tracking needs adjustment, or the tension needs adjustment, you should, until you have sufficient experience and knowledge yourself, get an experienced person to help you, preferably the shed boss or a member of the maintenance team. However, there are a number of us around that can make these adjustments for you, but make sure the person you are asking to do it knows what they're doing. 
the table can tilt to 45 degrees, lifting that way. And I'm about to demonstrate that. To allow it to, to unlock it, there are two screws underneath, one at the front of the table, one at the back, which only need a half turn or thereabouts. Then you lift from the rear, push, or lift from the left side as you're facing the saw, push with the right, and the table will tilt. Underneath, let me put it down because it'll be clearer to show. Underneath, there is an angle guide for where the table is sitting. And that way you can make angled cuts. Okay, in this workshop, we have three upright band saws. The two Lagunas, number one, closest to the back wall. Number two, which is the one I'm standing at, which is closest to the turning room door. And finally, the 21 inch Wadkin over in the back corner. That Wadkin is normally only used by the wood team in their cutting up of timber for sale. Each of these saws has standard blades normally fitted to them. Laguna number one has a 12 millimetre or half inch blade with three teeth per inch. It's used for resawing timber up to 100 to 150 mil and for gentle curves of up to two and a half inches or 65 mil. Number two, normally has a 10 mil or 3 8 inch blade right, uh, with four teeth per inch. It's used for resawing thinner timber, keeping it um, three teeth in contact with the timber at all times. So it's only a thin piece of timber that can be resawn on this. And it can cut tight curves or tighter curves up to about one and a half mil or 40 one and a half inches, sorry, or 40 mil in diameter. The Wadkin, however, has a much bigger blade on it. It has a 19 mil or three quarter inch blade on it with 1.3 teeth per inch. And this blade is purely for resawing big slabs of timber. Stuff over 150 mil high. If you have timber that you need to resaw, or timber of that size that you need to resaw, see a member of the timber team. There are not many other people who have accreditation to right. use this saw. When using any machinery, it's necessary to be aware of the safety requirements of that machine. For the bandsaw, the most obvious danger is the moving blade, which will literally take these off and you won't even notice until it's too late. Keep your hands away from the blade. There is a blue patch in the table, and that is considered the danger zone. However, good practice says that any time the end of your timber goes past the edge of the table, a push stick should be used. Timber, when it's being cut, must have a flat and stable base. This piece of pine that I'll be using later as you can see, has four nicely squared edges. It sits perfectly on the table, perfectly flat and easy to control. However, a round log has no stability whatsoever. So therefore, jigs must be used when you're cutting a round log. We'll go into that a little bit later. People with long hair, keep it tied back. Do not wear gloves, even though your hands might be sensitive because gloves can get caught in the moving blade, as can your long hair, and so can loose clothing. So always make sure your clothing is reasonably tight fitting, like my shirt. Don't wear gloves, because if you do happen to get just a little bit too close to the blade and the glove gets snagged, it's going to pull your hand straight into the blade. And that is not gonna be pretty. Okay, I've already shown you how to adjust the the blade guide, uh, the blade guard and the, the cutting guides. There is a set height that they should be. For the, this piece of wood that I've got on the table at the moment, the guard is set way too high. So we have to loosen it 
off and lower it down until it is approximately 5 to 10 millimetres above what you are cutting. That gives the blade stability as it enters the wood and will give you a nice straight even cut. There is an exception to that. If you need to resaw a large piece of wood and you need the fence to be set high, and I'll be going through the fence shortly, then obviously the guard cannot come down to the wood. It can only come down to the height of the guard, uh, the, the fence, sorry. And the height above the fence should be exactly the same as what it is above the wood, about five to 10 mil. When you are cutting timber, keep it to a manageable size. Something like this is perfectly suitable for one person. Something like this big piece is more suitable to two people. Reason being, the table, if you can pan down please, the table is too short for the operator to keep control of the back end of it when it's going through the blade. If you have a longer piece like this, make sure you get assistance from somebody who knows what they're doing just to support the back end of the of the timber as you push it through you are the person in control of the cut not your assistant they should not pull it push it or do anything they should just let it ride through their hands when you are working at the bandsaw make sure the floor area is clear around you for a considerable distance you do not want to get your foot tangled up with anything that may trip you or unbalance you. If you trip or get unbalanced, you may well go into the blade and hurt yourself. So keep the floor area clear of offcuts, too much sawdust, power cables, or anything else that may upset you. Okay, green timber should never, ever be cut on a band, on a, this band, or any of the band saws. Reason being, green timber has a lot of resin in it. That resin collects on the blade, blunts the blade, and will not work then through dry timber properly, and therefore you've made the blade unusable for anyone else. So never, ever cut green timber on a bandsaw. If you need to leave the bandsaw while, it, while you're still working, could be because you're going for a... a a cup of coffee at, at morning tea time or whatever, make sure the saw has stopped, has been stopped, and the blade is stationary. Never, ever leave the saw with the blade moving. It is too dangerous for other people coming past. If you have a look at where the blade is now, where I've been possibly cutting a piece of timber, I can quite easily put my hand into the saw, into the blade, and hurt myself without knowing. Bandsaw has been designed to be able to make a number of different cuts in timber. First up, you have a cross cut where the timber is going sideways through the timber, but to keep it stable, you should always use a mitre gauge. Oops, that way would be a bit of shot. Okay, there is a groove in the table that it fits into, and it keeps the timber very stable as it passes the blade. A diagonal cut can also be made, but once again, you use the mitre gauge. All you do is adjust it to the angle you want, put your timber on it and take it through the blade. Resawing timber is actually making it thinner and you're cutting through that part of the timber and through there and it's done there. To keep that timber stable, you must use a fence at minimum and probably a featherboard on the other side just to make sure it feeds dead straight. Rip sawing is when the timber is like that and you're cutting with the grain. Once again, a fence and featherboard. Freehand sawing is where you don't want a straight cut, you need to cut a curve into something. For example, you might be making a, a curved chair back or something like that. You can't use a fence, you've got to do it freehand. 
you mark up your timber and you literally pass it past the blade, ensuring that your delicate little pinkies go nowhere near the blade. If necessary, use push sticks as guides and pushers. Sometimes you may want to cut a circle in something, for example, to make a stool seat or something like that. That can be done two ways, either freehand by marking the circle on the timber you want, or you can use a circle cutting jig, which I'll demonstrate shortly. It has a pin on it. First up, you must find the centre of your piece of timber, drill a three mil hole in it, because that's the size of the pin in the jig, place your timber on it and pass it into the blade and then just twist the timber on that pin. Other cutting you may want to do involves a round log. Now, I showed you earlier that it is highly unstable and will not sit anywhere. So if you want to take slices off it to make coasters or something like that, you must use a V-jig that the log can sit in and be held stable by. If, however, you want to make a longitudinal cut in it, i.e. I rips or rips or it, you must use the fence, pick the most stable side of the timber to ride on, and the second most stable for, of it to ride against the fence. And you just pass it slowly through the blade. When you're cutting a curve, whether it be a circle or just a curve like I uh, mentioned cutting a chair back or something like that, that curve, the radius of it is dictated by two things. The thickness of the blade and the width of the curve of the blade. If we look down, a demonstration of the blade is right here. You can see the offset of the teeth to give the curve versus the width of the blade to give us a clearance angle. If we turn to there, you can see how that works when you're making the cut. The kerf cuts the width, but you can only turn it against the back corner of the blade. And that's what dictates the diameter of the curve you can cut. Obviously, all saws have limitations, whether they be a table saw, a drop saw, a band saw, or whatever. The biggest limitations of using the band saw are the width of the throat, which is from the blade to the frame. You cannot cut a cross cut anything longer than that. The other limitation is the depth of cut, and that's the height here. And that is dependent on two things, where you set your blade guide and the size of the blade on the saw. As explained earlier, the wad can, ob can obviously cut bigger stuff because it's got big wide gullets to, dis uh, to disperse the sawdust. This saw, with the small number of, or large number of teeth per inch and small gullets, cannot disperse sawdust very, very well and therefore you will burn your work, whatever. So the limitation, height limitation on this one is the size of the throat, or size of the cut you can make dictated by the blade. The reasons why you should work, use a bandsaw, why it's the best saw to use. Because the blade is smaller than a, a drop saw or a uh, table saw, you get a thinner kerf, therefore you have less wastage of timber. You can cut very thin pieces, i.e. veneers. I've seen people cut veneers less than one millimetre thick. That's a very experienced operator. I can't do that. I'm about two and a half mil. The other one is that on a fixed blade saw, like a, a drop saw or a table saw, you cannot cut curves. This saw you can, limited by the size of the blade in it. Reasons for not using a bandsaw, in other words, the cons, the size of the timber that you can cut is dictated by the limitations I've just mentioned. It's easy to disturb the setup of the machine. Not so much the tension and the tracking, but the setting of your guides. If the blade can wander, you will end up with a very poor cut. So you've got to be careful about not upsetting the setup on the machine. 
the relatively small table on a bandsaw makes it difficult to safely handle large pieces, larger pieces of timber. And therefore, maybe some cuts would be better done on one of the other saws. They're the three main reasons for not using a bandsaw. Okay, having gone through everything we have so far, the pros and cons of using the saw, how the saw's built, the safety features you need to take into account and all the rest of it, it's now time to start talking about how an operator will use the saw. It doesn't matter if you've seen people using it earlier in the day or whatever, always, always check the following. One, that the floor is clear. You're not going to trip or be unbalanced by anything on the floor. Clean it up if necessary. Check the blade tension. You can do just a quick glance through the window will tell you whether the blade is tensioned or not. Quick check of the blade tracking will tell you whether the gullets are sitting right or not. Check your guides, both top and bottom. Top guides are here, bottom guides are actually under the table and to look at them you've got to drop the dust guard as I showed you when we were opening the door. The bottom guides are exactly this one, just turned upside down. Make sure you've set your blade guard to the height you want it to be. Uh, we'll Make sure you lock the blade guard. As you can see, if I don't lock it, it moves quite a bit. That means your especially thrust bearing, the thrust guide at the back of the blade is not working properly. Now I've locked it, no movement. Check, before you even bring it to the table, you should check your timber for inclusions, metal, metal inclusions in particular, screws and nails for the like. There are metal detectors in the shelves over by the side wall. Check the timber that it's clean. If it's been sitting outside and had rain splattering on it and dirt splattering up from that, that dirt is gritty and will blunt the blade rapidly. Clean it off with a wire brush or a very stiff bristle brush to make sure that it's safe, it's not going to damage the machine. Okay, we're now ready to make a cut. We've done our checks. The first thing you've got to do is turn on the dust extraction. And the port, the dust extraction port for this machine is at the back of the machine. You can see the trunking and there is a gate there to open. The plug may or may not have been removed from the power point. If it has, plug it in. Don't turn it on just yet. Make sure your safety switch, the safety off, emergency off switch, is pulled out. Because without doing that, the saw will not start. Next thing to do is turn the saw on. Eight times out of ten, somebody, people have left the light on. The light has its own switch. The light is there so you can see what is happening at the cut. Just give the machine a quick burst and make sure the saw is tracking properly. When the, when the saw is running, the best way to stop it is use the foot brake. Just press it down until the blade stops and then release it. Okay, we're now ready to make a cut. First, we'll be starting with a state cost cut. Turn the saw on. Hold the wood clamp to the miter gauge with your hand, your other hand well clear of anywhere that could, that could get damaged. I find it most convenient to put it on top of the, my guide hand. Run the timber through the blade. Stop the saw. Once the, once the cut is complete. It's then safe to move that back and to remove the off cut. Okay, the next cut will be a diagonal cut. 
first set your miter gauge to the angle you want. This time I've set it to 45 degrees. Have your timber close to the blade, but not engaged. Turn the saw on, and once again, keeping your hands clear. Just feed the timber through like so. Remove your off cut and bring your piece of timber back. All band saws come with a fence. The fence suitable for the Laguna can be set either as a low fence or as a high fence. To fit it, slide it on over the front guide bar, move it to where you want. With a small piece of timber like this that I'm using, you can use a low fence. However, if the timber was taller, I would need to set this as a high fence, which means undoing the two lock screws, bringing it out, and setting it up like so. The drawback with that is my piece of timber passes straight past the blade. My fingers are in great danger. So, we, if we're using the fence high, as I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that the guides clear the fence by the five to 10 mils that we need. All right. For this cut, which is a whiz grain cutting, now you can see with grain, the grain, it runs that way in the timber. So cutting with the grain, you are actually running the blade in the same direction as the grain. So I'll be cutting it through like that. I don't need the fence set high. So I'll set it low. Lock it so it's where you want it. Set the fence so you get the depth of cut you want. And lock it on the bar. I've just shown you that you need to lift the guide when the fence is high. Because I'm not using a high fence, I now need to readjust it down to the height that I need for cutting that piece of timber and lock it. You would have seen it move then as I locked it up. Okay, as you can see where the timber is located, I'm going to be very, very close to the blade. So guess what I need to use? All right, once again, have the timber ready to, to, ready to cut close to the blade, but not actually engaged. Turn the saw on and just push it, push it through. And you can see what I mean by sawing with the grain. The next cut is resawing, and resawing is where you actually cut through the timber lengthways to make different size pieces. Instead of doing this one in half, I'm going to cut a thinner piece by adjusting the fence. And you can see there where the blade is set, I'm going to be cutting a piece that's going to end up about five mil thick. Once again, push sticks required. Ready to cut, turn the saw on. And in this case, I need to keep the, saw, the timber, because it's longer than the last piece, against the fence. So I use another push stick to feed the timber part. Okay, I've struck a problem, I've struck a problem, the timber is not going through. What the problem is, I have not lifted the guide enough and the timber is sitting on the guide. Now this is a good time to mention that you never 
remove a piece of timber from a moving blade. The reason for that is you can pull, the moving blade can jag in the timber and it can pull the blade out of the guides and damage the blade badly. Okay, so I've removed the timber from the, the guides and the blade and now I just need to lift it enough so that it will go through. Where it was jamming is on this lip at the back, just here. Not at the front, which is higher as you can see, just was jamming just on that lip there. Okay, having cleared that problem, I don't need to readjust the fence. I can just feed this piece of timber straight back in because the fence is set. The blade will go straight into the beginning of the cut that's already there. Turn the saw on. And just feed it in. As you just saw, once I cleared the prob problem of my own creation, the cut went smoothly. Bandsaws give quite a nice even cut, and as you can see, I've ended up with a piece of timber of five to six mil thick. All right, I've just shown you the result of a nice clean cut. That cut is a result of three things. One, the sharpness of your blade. Two, the correct height setting for your guides so that the blade can't slop around. And three, the speed of the cut, the speed of the feed of the timber through the blade. Now you saw when I was doing this that I was feeding it quite slowly. The harder you push and the faster you want to feed it, the more you will burn your timber, blunt the blade and, and possibly damage it as well. Now, there are really only two types of cuts. One is a cross cut, which I demonstrated with the uh, miter gauge, and cross cutting is where you are cutting across the grain. The other one is a rip cut, and it doesn't matter whether the piece of timber is sitting upright, sitting horizontal, or sitting with, so you're cutting across the grain there. A rip cut is when you are cutting with the grain, with the flow of the grain in the timber. Okay, I mentioned freehand cutting and the fact that you could cut curves. What you see here is just a thin veneer of pine that I've drawn a curved path on. Can't use a fence to cut that, can't use anything else, it's got to be done freehand. So I'm now going to show you how to do that and at the same time keep your fingers clear of the blade. Even though if we put this down you can see I'm going to end up over the blue in the danger area or the timber is I've got to keep my hands well clear so first thing is line up the line with the line of the blade make sure it's not engaged with the blade turn the saw on keeping the hands well back gently what I'm doing here is just gently turning the timber so that the blade is falling just off the line. I'm managing to keep my fingers well clear of the blade. And here, as the back edge of the timber gets close to the blade, I've got to start guiding with my other hand behind the blade so that I do not damage my hand that is leading into the blade.
Now, I haven't made a very good job of following the line. That was me concentrating as much on talking to you people as it was making the cut. However, when you are making a cut like that, you should never actually cut through the line. You should cut just beside it so that then you can make a nice smooth sanded finish on your timber. Okay, the next cut we're going to demonstrate is a circle cut using the circle cutting jig. Now when I bring the jig over you'll see that it's, it won't fit on the table with the fence on it. So I have to remove the fence, unlock it, pull it back so that I can lift it past the frame, take it off. put it down beside the saw. And then we'll get the circle cutting jig, which like all the jigs, hangs on the wall between the two saws. All right, as you can see, it's got a guide bar that will fit into the mitre slot on the saw. Put it on and bring it up and it will sit on the saw. You can see now why I have to remove the fence. There's not enough room for both. Here we have a ruler. This will measure the radius of your cut from the pin to the blade. Not the diameter. We have a piece of wood. In this case, it's 200 by 205 mil. So it's a 200 mil. I need no more than a 100 mil circle. Now, as you can see, if the cameraman will pan in, the cutting here, the ruler starts at 200, over 200 mil. So we've got to take 100 off to get to what we want. So we loosen the clamp on the guide, we pull it, there you go. pull it back. If I set that to 210, that is 100 mil. That will have me cutting right on the edge of this board. I don't want to do that, so I'll take it in by five mil and we'll end up with a smaller circle. Tighten up your clamp on your on your guide make sure it's not going to move but do not over tighten it the next thing you have to do if you haven't should have already done this marked up the center of your board and drilled a three mil hole in the board that's so that it will fit over the pin now sometimes it goes on straight away sometimes it's a bit fiddly I like to get down on my knees and have a look at what I'm doing. And there we go, we're on. Make sure your board spins freely on the pin, but doesn't have excessive sideways or fore and aft movement. Now, this jig has been set up with a stop board at the front of it and that will stop against the fence bar at the front of the table so that the pin ends up exactly level with the front of the front of the blade. We turn the saw on. It doesn't matter where I feed this in, parallel like that or like that. I just like to go in first. Hold the board down. And go in until that stop board hits the fence, uh, the fence side. Once it's in like that, Hold it in with your belly so it doesn't move and then just slowly rotate the timber. Make me 
make sure you keep your hands well clear of that blade all the time. back to where your circle started, just approach it very slowly and the saw will cut through, stop the saw. Now we're going to have trouble getting that out, the easy way is just to break your off cut, move the table back, lift your piece off and yes there is just a very slight jag where the two cuts met, that will easily sand off and you've got yourself a perfect circle. Okay, cutting logs. Talked about this earlier. If you're cross cutting, you need to use this jig to stop the log from rolling around and being unstable in the cut. Once again, your hands are used to stabilize it and make sure everything's fine. Bring it up close to where you need to be. Start the saw and then just slowly feed it through. You just might be able to see some sparking happening on those guys that I mentioned earlier. As you get close to the end of the cut, bring your free hand over just to support the cut, support the cut off it, and finish. And now we have a smaller piece. Okay, the final cut is cutting this bit of log with a rip cut going through that way. Now, I said we had to use the fence, but a low fence like that is no good. The bot log's going to roll straight over it. So we need to change the fence to a high side. Lock it in place. This time, I can actually leave the guides a lot closer to where they need to be because I'm just going to cut this bit in half, or roughly in half. Lock it up. Now, I said you need to find a couple of stable sides. Now, if you look at this, you can see I've got two lumps almost opposite each other where small branches came off, off the main branch. What I want is to use the other side as my flat side on the table. With only one small bump there, as opposed to a much bigger one here, that's going to be on the table. And I'm actually going to turn it slightly so that it is riding between those bumps. All right, once again, close to the blade, disengaged. A push stick handy because I'm going to be coming up close to the blade. Turn it on. Once again, we've ended up with a nice, smooth, clean cut. Okay, signs that things may be going wrong with your cut are if the timber is hard to push through the blade, and you saw that happen to me because I'd misadjusted the guides, stop the saw. Find out what the problem is and either rectify it yourself like I was able to or get somebody to help you. Other signs that things are going wrong. If you smell burning, that means that the blade is not cutting the timber properly. 
and you are going to end up with burn marks on your timber at, wor at, at best, at worst, you'll be damaging the machine and blunting the blade because it's overheating. If the blade oscillates or bends, an oscillation, if you can pan down please, is when the blade does that, wanders side to side. Sometimes when you're cutting, the blade will actually look as though it's bending like that and your cut will run offline. Stop, find out why it's happening. And if the blade makes a loud screaming noise, yes, it always makes a bit of noise when it's going through the, the timber, but you will know when, it's, when the blade is hurting. It will scream at you. Always, always, always stop the blade immediately using the foot brake. Gently remove your piece of timber from the stopped blade. If necessary, Lift the blade guide a bit and use a push stick to hold the blade back against the back guide while you gently extricate the blade, uh, extricate the timber from the blade. Don't ever, ever not use that and just pull the timber because as you can see, the blade will move quite a bit. And if you pull it enough, it will come out of the guides and be damaged. If you can't extricate it, or you can't work out what the problem was, find an experienced operator, the shed boss, a member of the maintenance team, get help. Do not ever try and sort things out for yourself if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, sometimes if I, for example, if I'd cut that circle a bit larger, I would have offcuts coming off. The safe way to remove them is to bring your hand in wide and come in from behind to remove the timber, the offcut timber. Never ever come in from the front to get it because if you're bumped or lose, miss your footing or something like that, bang, in you go into the blade. Okay. That is how the saw is used, what it is used for, and now we have to talk about what you need to do when you've finished your operations of the saw. First up, make sure it's stopped. Clean the saw up. As you can see, there's quite a bit of sawdust on the table. That will interfere with other people's cuts. There is a little bit of sawdust come down on the floor. It needs to be cleaned up as well. Any offcuts that may have fallen to the floor need to be cut, cleared up. Once you've cleaned the table and the surrounds, lower the blade guide to the table. What that does is protect other people from the blade. You cannot get into that blade without deliberately doing it past the uh, guide nuts. make the saw safe. All you need to do is turn off at the power point and close the dust extraction port. Once all that's done, you're finished. The biggest thing to remember is always leave the saw in the state you would like to find it when you come to make a cut. Thank you for your attention.